So we're on Luke's gospel, according to Luke. First four chapters, we're now in chapter two. We've been in chapter two for a couple of weeks. Um, and Luke is painting a picture for us in chapter two. As he painted a picture in chapter one, and the picture looks a little bit like this. It took me hours to draw that. So Luke is painting a picture of two worlds colliding together. The blue one, is that working? There we go, look at that. 14.99 of Amazon. Uh, I've got to get some use out of this. I've used it once before, and that was a year ago. So we've got one world here. This is our world that we live in, the world represented by blue. So in his beginning of Luke chapter 2, that's represented by uh, Caesar Augustus, the Roman Empire, the rule, the power. And in that world, what's valued are these, th these things here, power, success, strength, and wealth. And with the birth of Jesus, Luke is painting a picture where that world is being invaded by this lovely orange world here. That's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven or heaven on earth. Heaven is invading earth in and through Jesus. So heaven is not somewhere we go. Somewhere, uh, heaven is something that's coming here in and through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And in this kingdom, we've got a different set of value systems where they value humility, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, honesty, truth, love, et cetera, et cetera. And what this basically boils down to, what, what Luke is uh, potentially maybe, don't, don't quote me on this, but maybe what he's potentially quoting here is, in a world where power, success, wealth, strength is what we value, it puts us in competition with one another. We compete. But in a world where the value system is humility, honesty, love, kindness, all of those things, it releases us from that world of competition. We're no longer competing. We're free from that. And instead, we get to live by our purpose, our God-given purpose. And this is the shady bit between the two worlds. This is the current stage we live in at the moment. So we're kind of both worlds. It's the, it's the now and the not yet. So in one world, we've got competition. In one world, we're free to live purposefully. Just to define those two things, to compete is defined like this in the standard English dictionary. It says to strive to gain or win something by defeating or establishing superiority over others. We are released from that kind of world and released into a world of purpose. And this is the basic definition for purpose. The reason for which something is done or created for which something exists. In other words, what you were made for, what we were made for. And what I'd love to talk to you about this morning is purpose. How do we live in a world that's orientated, geared to, competing? How do we live our purpose in a world where actually our purpose probably has no weight, probably has not much meaning um, or um, much about it? In fact, the world will look at our purpose, um, maybe with disdain, maybe feeling sorry for us, or maybe with just lack of understanding. How do we live in a world where we're programmed to compete when we all along have this god given purpose. We all have one, unique and specific to who we are. Each of us is what we're made for. So how do we live in a world of purpose? Well, hopefully, I really hope that the um, next passage will speak to us. We're still in Luke chapter 2. We're going to be reading from verse 41. The screen is working. Thank you, Ben Kinsley, wherever you are. Not only are you playing piano, electric guitar, and I think you're playing something else with your feet here as well, but you're also fixed the computer for us. Thank you. It says this in verse 41. Gosh, my eyes are going. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to their custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking that he was still in their company, they traveled for a day. Then they began looking for him around, uh, among the relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, parents, you will know this. They were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? 
Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, Jesus asked. Did you not know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying. Then they went down to Nazareth. Oh, he, went, he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all of these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Amen. Amen. Would you um, pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we, we are made for something, that we have a purpose in you. Lord, would you speak through an old fool today? Would you help us to understand our purpose, how to live our purpose in a world that possibly may not even value or give any weight to the purpose that you give us? But Lord, we hold firm that our purpose does carry weight and, and purpose and meaning in the world to come. Amen. Amen. Have you ever been under pressure to perform? Have you got a bit of a reputation for yourself for being good at something, maybe? And now everyone expects that good thing from you again and again and again. This once happened to me on the golf course. Uh, I think I once hit a really good shot in front of a couple of customers. And then I played in another golf day. And I was on the tee and I was about to hit my ball. And I could hear this guy who I was with, the previous one. And he said, he's really good. He's going to hit this a mile. Part of me was thinking, yes, yes, I am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much that you saw that one shot that I hit was really good. Um, but then the nerves kicked in. And I was holding my golf club. And all sorts of things were going on in my head. The pressure started to mount. And there's a thing in golf called a shank. And if anyone plays golf, you know what it is. It goes off exactly 45 degrees from where you aimed it. And it doesn't go any less further either. It can still go really far in 45 degrees. It goes 45 degrees in the wrong direction, which unfortunately for me was outside of the entire boundary of the whole golf course. Ball lost, uh, had to reload. Very embarrassing. Uh, that guy was left a bit bemused by how <laughs> I responded on the tee. And I played awfully for the rest of the day. So I was very grateful to him for saying that before I teed off. The same has happened with Tara, with my wife. She produced a court statement. She was a social worker. She produced a court statement, and then an email was sent to her boss by the judge commending Tara on the best court statement he'd ever read. But the pressure that put on her for every other court statement to write was painful for her because she had to deliver to that standard time and time again, and it put a lot of pressure on her. And if there's ever been pressure on someone to form, it's got to be Jesus, isn't it? The man with the purpose of all purposes. All of the Old Testament prophecies pointing towards him. Earlier in Luke's gospel, in chapter 1, we read this only a couple of weeks ago. It says that he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. No pressure, Jesus. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will replace the long-awaited king. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end or will have no end. That's a heck of a weight to have on your shoulders. Can you imagine the pressure? Can you imagine the focus that that will require, the drive in his life, the time, the effort? Thank goodness that his purpose is not mine, and maybe you might be feeling the same. But there is a purpose for your life a unique purpose that's shaped just the shape you are. It's unique to you. No one else can fill those boots. You have a specific calling. It makes no sense in this world, but it absolutely makes sense in this world that is invading our world. But how do we live with purpose? How do we live with purpose? I think Jesus points out Two, two things for us. And the first is that purpose is always now. There's a nowness, an instantness about purpose. Purpose is not about what you can do, what you are good at. It's about who you are. Purpose is ready to go right here 
and right now. But we are programmed to think that we live by what we can do, by what we're good at, what we can achieve. And as a result, we are programmed to live for the next thing, the next season, the next thing that's coming in our lives, the next promotion, the next stage, possibly the next age category of our children when they leave home, maybe. We see this best in our kids, India and Zavi. They're six and four. Daily, they tell me they want to be seven and five. They cannot wait. I remember being 12, desperate to be 13 so I could call myself a teenager, only to realize I was just as desperately powerless as I was when I was 12. I remember wanting to get out of college and just go and earn some cash, earn some money, have a bit of cash in my pocket, get some power in my life. I need to realize my parents insisted on charging me rent as soon as I got my first page check in. And I was just as skint as I was before I started work. We do this with our lives. We are constantly looking to usher in the next thing. And the trouble with that is it's not what we're made for. It means that we're waiting for something to happen before we do the next thing. It takes us out of the space which is now, which is what calling and purpose is all about. We become obsessed with where we should be rather than where we are. But purpose is about the now. And to live purposefully means to look around and see where we are, to see what's going on around us, and to ask, what is God wanting to do through me in this situation, in the here and the now? purpose is about this season, not the next season. Purpose is live. Somebody has hit play. Somebody's hit the record button. I was going to do action. I needed one of those little slots to do for those little clapperboards for a movie scene. There's a now about our purpose. And there's a necessity too. We see Jesus, age 12, unbelievable, in Jerusalem with his entire clan. It says he stayed in Jerusalem. Other translations say that he lingered. He's not lost. He's chosen to stay in Jerusalem. He's chosen what is necessary for his purpose. On the surface, it looks like he's lost and he has been left behind. In fact, I was even introduced it this morning to someone as the story about when Jesus was lost in the temple. He ain't lost. He's exactly where he needs to be for his purpose. There's a necessity about his purpose, which puts him in places where he might not want to be. And the same is for us. Jesus is fully fulfilling his purpose by being in the temple. And when they found him, they asked, why are you treating us like this? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? He's busying himself with God's business. Message translation says he's dealing with the things of my father. Jesus is busy with God's work. He ain't waiting for nothing. He's not waiting for the next season. His purpose is life. Purpose is not about achieving. It's not about succeeding or gaining. It's all about who you are. It's not what you're expected to do or what you're expected to be. It's about who you are. Purpose is always now. Secondly, Jesus helps us to see that purpose is always learning. Purpose isn't about what we're good at. It's not what we've done before or about what we've done before, where our skill set lies necessarily. It's not about what you're paid for. It's about what you're made for. And that's hard to discern and to work out at times. We are programmed by a world that competes. And when we're competing with one another, then we've got to go for what we're good at. We've got to go for what we've got skills at. When we're striving to survive, we don't have time to think beyond what we're good at and what we've always done. But God's given purpose has other plans for what we're good at and what we've got skills in. It's something completely new for us. 
And I think purpose can sometimes offer, bring us into something that's new, either a new skill, either a new initiative, or maybe just doing the old thing in a whole new way, flipping it inside out. Whatever your purpose, wherever it leads to, it wants to teach you something new for this new thing. It requires us to learn and to grow. Jesus is in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, asking questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. He's 12. Surely he's out of his league, (laughs) sat in with those religious teachers. Surely there's a little bit of a feeling of inadequacy. If I could describe the most common emotion around my calling to the priesthood, to be a priest, throughout my whole training, even today, I think it's the feeling of inadequacy. One of my mates said, John, nothing about you, says Vicar. (laughs) Thanks, Jay. (laughs) And I think he's got a point. I've sat in meetings where I haven't got a clue what they're talking about. They're using words that I don't even know what they mean, let alone having some kind of input to help this meeting go any further. We are already looking at the end of my curacy here at St. Matthias. It's um, not that far away. We're being asked to think about church planting as one of the options. I've got to be honest, I really don't want to do it. I'm petrified of it. It's totally out of my league. It's well beyond me. Well beyond what I can achieve. I am absolutely bricking it. I feel inadequate. But purpose is always learning because purpose wants to put you and I into places and situations where you are going to be out of your league, where you're going to be stretched where you don't know everything and you haven't got the right skill set, the right tools in the bag. But that's okay. Because we have a God who promises to be with us. If you remember the story in Exodus 3, it's where uh, Moses meets God at the burning bush. And Moses is kind of negotiating with God a bit about his calling. He's giving him a purpose to set his people free, release my people from Israel. And he keeps bartering with God and he says, But who am I? Who am I that you would ask me to go and do this work for you? He's out of his league. He knows he's out of his league. And what's really interesting, I've I've read this a few times this first, and I've never seen this before. But God doesn't say, Moses, don't worry. You're a great speaker. You're a great leader. You've got all the skills you need. You're brilliant. The people are going to love you. He doesn't say any of those things. All he says is that I will be with you. I wonder if that's you as well, because it's me. I'm looking for the right level of affirmation to tell me that I will be good enough, that I will have enough to do a church plant or to lead a church one day. But maybe the better encouragement is not to tell me that. It's to say, yes, John. You are rubbish and you are out of your league, but God is with you, is the right encouragement. So Jesus teaches us that purpose is always now and purpose is always learning. And then Mary and Joseph, I think they give us two quick things to ponder about our purpose. And the first is that purpose never assumes we have God. They've lost God, basically. There's no other way of putting it. It's a reminder that we can walk off too and go into situations and experiences without God with us. Worse still, it may be even that we think that it is about us taking God into situations rather than meeting God in the situations that he's called us to. If God is the meaning behind our purpose, then surely it's him that leads us into situations. Abraham Lincoln famously said, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side. I think that is so important. The vision for our purpose is God's, and therefore we need to be on his side, not our side and not what we want. 
purpose without God. Ain't no purpose at all. Without God, the purpose provider, the one who calls us, our purpose dries up, fizzles out, calls off, and we begin to look for the next thing. We begin to look for things where we have skills and what we've done before. But we can find God in Scripture, in prayer, in honest conversations with one another. And most importantly, we can find him in worship. We come here together. We worship together. God must lead our purpose. Purpose is always now. Purpose is always learning. It never assumes we have God. And lastly, purpose never assumes we know Jesus. Mary and Joseph come back to Jerusalem looking for a child, but they find a man. He's 12 years old, and in ancient Israel, that is the coming age to be a man. That's, that's adulthood. I'm really glad it wasn't in my time. It would have been a right mess. It's a significant age for him, and he has decided that he's not the child that they left behind. He's not what they were looking for. And Jesus can be like that for sometimes. Sometimes I think we want him to be safe. We want him to be controllable. We want to him to be measured to our taste. But Jesus is slippery. He's like a wet bar of soap in the shower. He can slip out of our fingers. And Jesus is always looking to change what people think about him, who they think he is. The disciples were constantly left baffled by him, never fully able to pin him down and shove him in a box. We can never assume we know him. With God, there is always mystery. And I think we're really uncomfortable in mystery. But we need to learn to be comfortable in mystery. Because mystery isn't something that we can never know. J.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings, describes the mystery of God as something that is endlessly knowable. Jesus is endlessly knowable. We can never fully get our heads around him. Purpose is always now. It's always learning. It never assumes we have God. And it never assumes that we fully know Jesus. And just to finish, I don't know how long this notebook will take. I didn't really write it. But this matches another story in this gospel. It's like a bookend. Luke starts his gospel with this story and he ends it with another one just like it. It's the story of the road to Emmaus. In both stories, the people have lost God. They've lost Jesus. They've both lost them for three days. Jesus has been dead for three days in the road to Emmaus. And Joseph and Mary have lost Jesus for three days. And with it comes anxiety, comes worry. But there's a difference between these stories. You hear about Mary and Joseph. They are anxiously looking. If you've ever lost something precious... I lost India at one of our church hangouts in the park. I couldn't see her. I went nuts trying to find her. I was sprinting up and down. Probably ran more than I've ever run in a year. Looking for her, ripping bushes apart, shouting. I couldn't find her. She was talking to one of you lot on one of the picnic blankets, and I just couldn't see her. She was in my blind spot. I was anxiously searching for her. And in the disciples, we see something different. There's lots said about them in the translations that they're sad that they look downcast, long-faced. One of them, which I think is the best, is they look lost. They're lost without him. They are anxious without him. And there's a difference between the two of them. One of them is anxiously searching, and the other is just anxious. Wherever you're at, God's promise is always to be with you. And we can lose him sometimes. We can lose sight of him. We can stop hearing from him. And that's okay. Because his promise is always to be with us. The difference is how we choose to respond. Are we going to anxiously search for him if we've lost him? Or are we just going to remain anxious without him in our lives? I'll end with this. Revelation 3.20 says this. This is Jesus being quoted. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. 
if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me.